Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Ralph Jacobson. And me, George A. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. The texts for Good Friday, April 10, 2020, are Isaiah 52, 13 through 53, 12, Psalm 22, Hebrews 10, 16 through 25, and the gospel reading always on Good Friday is John 18, 1 through 19, 42, the passion narrative according to John. So this will be a very different uh, Good Friday for many, uh, a Good Friday that uh, maybe uh, highlights the isolation and uh, loneliness of the cross. And, uh, and so uh, maybe that's, you know, we've talked about in the past of, this is obviously a really large text and, and people have a lot of different uh, kinds of ways of marking Good Friday with seven last words or tenebrae services. But if you are preaching the passion narrative or thinking about uh, entering into that passion narrative, uh, it's, it, it, I think it's, it's a poignant moment in this particular passion narrative, uh, according to John, where you have his mother at the foot of the cross with him. And, uh, and, and then the beloved disciple, the disciple whom Jesus loves and who loves Jesus. And so uh, maybe that's, uh, maybe that's a, a promising and, or maybe better comforting word on uh, a day like this when many of us are not going to be together who feel, uh, who feel alone. <laughs> and, uh, but that, that promise of those who love us are, are there with us. So that's one. Another place I'd land in this text is uh, Peter's denial, which is uh, very different in the Gospel of John than uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Peter is asked, do you know the man? Uh, and in the Gospel of John, the question to Peter is, are you one of his disciples? And his ironic response is, I am not. <laughs> And uh, that's a place I'm landing this year as well with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is uh, this, is a, this is a call to discipleship like, uh, like maybe we haven't seen in a really long time. Uh, Peter deny, doesn't deny Jesus, he denies his own identity as a disciple. And we have to step into that now in ways that we, um, in, in uncharted ways maybe, uh, ways that would uh, maybe elicit Peter's response. No, I'm not one of his disciples, um, but, but that it, this is a call this year to say, I am, I am one of Jesus' disciples. And, uh, and, and how do we uh, live into that and embody that in uh, challenging and new ways this particular year? I love both of those ways into the text for right now. Can I, can I ask you a question following up on the mother of Jesus? Yeah. So in 1927, when the, the beloved disciple, NRSV has takes her into his home, but it's literally takes her like among his own. Um, it's ace ta idea. Is that, I should have done this work, you know, before we started recording, but is that something that we see elsewhere in John that to be among one's own, one's, one's idea? For family? Uh, well, it, it's most prominent in uh, chapter 10, uh, mm -hmm. where uh, I, I know my own and my own know me. Okay, there, yeah. Because yeah, it's not so, a dwelling. It's not talking about a physical dwelling. It's literally he takes her in among his own, his own people. Yeah, and so that would, uh, what that is doing there is recalling, uh, particularly in John 10, but throughout the gospel of, of bringing one into uh, a new community when that community is uh, fractured or broken or lost, and so it's uh, so it's not a, a it's not a physical place necessarily as it is relationship. That would be another way to that would be another way to translate it. You know, bringing bringing her into um, bringing her into a relationship and into a community that she uh, that she wouldn't necessarily have um, and. Uh, and then the same is true with Jesus saying, um, woman, behold your son. Uh, the same is true for him of, of bringing him in that. So that's re that reciprocal mutual uh, indwelling with each other uh, is really 
I think really what's going on there. I think that's a, a powerful way to speak into this moment uh, for me, you know, that um, one of the things that uh, we have a colleague who teaches pastoral care, Carla Dahl said to me is that um, grief and loss um, heighten our need for connectedness. And so you see it in the text, uh, the grief and loss of uh, Mary losing her son, or in this case, Jesus' mother, it doesn't say Mary, but um, ne the need for connectedness and us being separated from each other, it heightens our need for connectedness, first of all, with God then, Carla said, and then also with each other. And people by now, it's very possible, uh, you know, the listeners have lost someone to this pandemic by this point, that it's not, um, it's not a um, infection that's going on outside, but maybe it's come now inside the community and we've actually lost people. We certainly lost for a short time, at, at least when we're recording this podcast at the end of March, we've lost uh, the connectness, but now people are losing uh, loved ones. And, uh, and um, you know, <clears throat> probably here at, at Luther Seminary, where we record, uh, where, where we are based, you know, uh, people in our community are going to be getting sick. And, um, you know, God forbid we lose somebody. But so that need for connectedness, uh, that, that that portion Matt talks out of being drawn into his own, that the people of God then provide that connectedness both to each other and to God. Also, um, what uh, in times of disruption and uh, loss, uh, is uh, routine, and um, our routines have been disrupted. And so what are the patterns that we can continue that will uh, uh, be like, um, uh, th as the, the uh, text ends, um, they uh, took the body of Jesus, wrapped it in spices and linen clo cloths, according to the custom. And... Um, they, they dealt with loss by finding, uh, by continuing a ritual. And we've lost those uh, practices right now. So what are the ones that we can create in this moment uh, that uh, in essence live into uh, forming community in a different way and finding patterns um, when the patterns that we uh, so, are so familiar with? Uh, have been uh, disrupted. I think I see the, I, I like that joy about how that gets incarnated, you know, embodied in, in, in how we're living these days. I like the Johannine passion narrative right now with the, you know, the what is truth statement from Pilate, which mm. I, I take as, as cynical on his part. But in many ways, this is a story about not just what is truth, but who is truth and how is that identified and who has the perception into Jesus' true identity. And this is going to maybe, maybe Joy will like this. Everybody else will be shocked to hear me. I'm, I'm willing to preach John 18 and 19 alongside Psalm 22. Woo! The Johanna and Synoptic get together. Um, because that cry, why have you forsaken me, is also a cry about truth. It's very much a cry about perception, but it's it's perhaps also the cry of one who is having a difficult time locating the truth of God's reliability of what that looks like in a present moment of deep crisis in terms of Psalm 22. Um, it's who do you trust? Um, and how do you trust in God when it's God's appearance is perhaps coming or God's presence or activity is not um, coming in ways that you've been trained to perceive. You know, uh, we've had uh, some some of these lament psalms uh, <laughs> over the past few podcasts for Monday, Thursday, and uh, also for for the Sunday of the Passion. Um, and it's interesting just to, just intellectually and spiritually for, uh, first to imagine them on on the lips of the, the ancient psalmist before Jesus than to imagine them reflecting Jesus' reality that he takes up these Psalms, especially Psalm 22. And then now on our neighbors, I mean, uh, mouths as they are sick, as they are suffering. Um, and, and, and I especially think of people who are suffering, um, who don't have access to hospitals 
and, and ventilators and respirators and uh, you know, the description of the of the trauma that the psalmist is going through that now people are praying these prayers uh, in, out of the midst of their own ill health. I appreciate that, Ralph. I was thinking the same thing as Matt was speaking, is that that, again, is a familiar pattern. Uh, these are the hymns, the psalms that sustained the people. And it's okay to cry out to God. Even Jesus cried out. And God can hear our fear, um, our frustration, uh, our fragility. And maybe the best comfort we can have is crying out in a song that is familiar and that that will bring to us a reminder that we are part of maybe not a community that we're sit sitting next to today, but we are part of a long line of witnesses who have held to this faith. I think too, uh, going back to the Good Friday text, the Passion text, we talked about this a couple weeks ago of finding places in the text that you would not necessarily, that, that maybe you would overlook uh, or the way in which uh, an event like this causes you to uh, see things that, or things pop up or have more, uh, you know, they're more clear in your mind. Uh, but, you know, there's this detail at the end of the story. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had been laid. Of course, that's unique to the Gospel of John, the garden, and uh, and it it has uh, it has extraordinary um, you know allusions both to Genesis, but uh, but to uh, for for going back to the very beginning of this passage uh, passion narrative, it was a it was a place of community, it was a place of comfort, it was a place of friendship. Uh, and love for Jesus and the disciples. They often met there. Uh, they were often there. And it points forward to the resurrection. And so uh, this uh, maybe maybe doing something with the garden metaphor of of the way in which uh, we wait for we wait for gardens or that gardens are um, uh, gardens do bring hope and new life and uh, and that that already in this story is pointing forward to uh, the promise of the resurrection.